The subject here is how to build a square wave oscillator using a SN7414 hex inverter integrated circuit. This has six complete inverters in the 14 pin integrated circuit, but what is unique is they, have, they are Schmidt trigger inverters, and we'll explain why that's important and how to construct really simple square wave oscillators. This is the actual circuit I built. That's right, I use real circuits, not simulators. This is your integrated circuit, the SN7414. And to set, and to set the frequency of your square wave oscillator, all you gotta do is a single resistance. In this case, I used a 100K potentiometer in series with a 22K resistor and a single capacitor. That's all it takes. Uh, the LED is here in the, so you could watch it blink. Uh, you won't see it in this. This is just the picture. But let's, let's move on and see what is inside the 7414 integrated circuit. Here are the internal connections of the 7414 that I used in this project. It is a 14-pin integrated circuit. It's been around for a couple of decades. It's nothing new. Has six complete inverters, inputs and outputs, arranged on the pins as you see here in the picture. You can use any one of them, and I just used one for this demonstration, one and two, but they all work the same. Here is my schematic for the circuit on the board. I essentially have one resistive path and a capacitor. The idea is that I'm going to charge up this capacitor based on the logic level on the output at B. We'll gradually charge up a capacitor whose test point is A. What are we doing here? Let's start out at this point. It start out the output B goes low. The char and it went low because previously the capacitor charged up to three volts, sending the output low. And so we're going to start right there. When the output goes low, the, as shown here, the current the capacitor will discharge back through R1, R2, and at end of the 7414 input. It will discharge, it started at 3 volts, it will discharge down to approximately 2 volts. Now the state on B changes, it swaps, switches over to high, as shown here. The current path, when B is high, uh, current will begin to charge back up capacitor C through R1 and R2. So look at it this way. When B goes low, the capacitor discharges through R1 and R2. When the output B goes high, the capacitor will charge back up. So it will follow on discharge, the output will be low. That's why you have a discharge. When it reaches a critical point at 2 volts, it will suddenly, the output will go high, it will recharge the capacitor again until it reaches three volts, and the output goes low again and discharges the capacitor and on and on. And that's how you generate a square wave. It's, you look at it, it's, it's simply an output feeding back, charging and discharging the capacitor. Let's discuss an RC charge curve. That is, we are charging a capacitor through a resistance. If you've seen, you probably may have seen this on some of my other videos. This is an RC charge curve. When you apply voltage, and it's assuming that the resistor and capacitor are in series, R times C, and remember C has to be in farads, will give you the time period known as T for one charge period. But to become fully charged really takes five times R times C. 
For our sake here in this circuit, we're only interested in one T. When you first apply power to the circuit, the input on the capacitor is zero. And in a time period set by R times C, it will charge up to 63.2% of the input voltage. Remember our input voltage in this case is 5 volts. All right, and 63.2% of 5 volts is 3.16 volts. So within a, within a little under 1T on this charge curve, this will hit about 3 volts. Now remember, the charge voltage for C is coming from the output. When this hits around 3 volts, the output will switch low. The capacitor, instead of staying, well, what's happening is when the output switch is low, the capacitor voltage will drop back to about 2 volts. When it hits 2 volts, the output will go high again, then it charges back up to about 3, 2, 3, 3, 2, excuse me, and it goes back and forth in this narrow section, never completely discharging, never fully charging. It just feeds back, back and forth, somewhere between one-third T, this time period in here. Now, I'm just doing this for illustration purposes. If you actually put it on an oscilloscope, it would be something like one here, 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 and you will see an oscilloscope picture of what's actually happening. This works great at 5 volts. So what happens is once it's switching, it's just going from 2 to 3 volts on the input, charging and discharging through, two, through the pot and the resistor and point A on the capacitor. Here's a more blown up drawing of both the output at B and the input at A. So if we start with a low output, it will discharge A down to 2 volts. Output will switch high and will begin to charge the capacitor to about 3 volts. Then the output will switch low and so on. To get a full square wave, requires a complete discharge charge um, time period. So T is really half the time period of the square wave on the output. Note that when I check these on my, uh, as I used a particular type of Radio Shack multimeter that measures frequency, period, and duty cycle, the duty cycle here was about 47%. It's fairly symmetrical. Uh, it's plenty good enough for a lot of reasons. But note again, for the, when we start calculating values, I need a complete charge discharge curve to get a complete square wave. It charges on a high out, discharges on a low out. Here's an actual picture of the waveform generated on my oscilloscope. Just as I said, it charges on a high, discharges on a low, and you notice they follow each other exactly. Charge on a high out, discharge on a low out. This is the actual waveforms at A and B. All right, referring back to our charge curve again, we have R times C is from 0 to 63%. So to go from about 2 thirds T to T approximately is not going to be R times C by itself. I'm going to have a percentage. By experimentation, I found out that if you, if you take C, R times C and divide 2.8, you will get your T. If you multiply that T times 2, 
that's the time or period for the whole square wave. And if you take the reciprocal of that value, you can get the frequency. So let's run through that again. Uh, um, R times C or C times R, you will multiply the capacitor value times the resistance value, the capacitor being in farads. Um, you will take that value, you will divide by 2.8. I found this by experimentation and testing. I didn't get it out of a book. Then you will get the um, half period T. But remember, I have to have a complete discharge charge cycle to get a complete square wave. That's why I multiply that value that I derived by 2. The time here is approximately the same time as here, very close. And so once again, C times R, whatever that turns out to be, divide by 2.8, multiply that value by 2, take a reciprocal or divide it into 1, and you get the frequency. Okay, example problem one. My capacitance is one microfarad. My resistance is 21,700 ohms. Why was that? Because I used it originally with a single 22K resistor that actually measured 21,700 ohms on a multimeter. All right, R times C is going to come out Remember, convert C to farads, and that's point um, zero 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 one times twenty one thousand seven hundred gives you twenty one point seven milliseconds. Okay. To derive T, I'll take twenty one point seven milliseconds divide by two point eight. And that's going to give me 7.75 milliseconds. All right, to get the frequency, I'm going to take one, that is, I'm going to do the reciprocal of two times t. Two times t is 15.5 milliseconds. Take the reciprocal, and that calculates to a value of 64.5 hertz. When I measured it, the frequency output was 63.3 hertz, or a 2% error. Hey, not bad. The duty cycle was 47%, which means it's fairly symmetrical. I'll discuss in another video how to use this and to get, to get a perfect square wave. But it's a 47% duty cycle, very close to a symmetrical square wave. All right, let's work out example Number two, C is 34.72 microfarads. I derived that, either though the capacitor itself, and it was a polarized electrolytic, said 33 microfarads. That's what it actually measured on my cap capacitor meter. And I'm going to reuse the 21,700 ohm resistor. R times C in this case gave me 0.7534 seconds or stated again, 753.4 milliseconds. All right, 0 0.7534 seconds divided by 2.8 gives me 0 0.2691 seconds, or 269.1 milliseconds. That is my value for T. Now we're going to get the frequency. I'm going to take 2 times t and take the reciprocal of 2 times t. Well, 2 times t is 0 0.53816 seconds. Take the reciprocal of that value. It is 1.86 hertz. When I measured it on my frequency counter, and the res and there's a limited resolution on that particular meter, uh, I measured 1.9 hertz at a 47% duty cycle. I mean, you're not going to get much better than a 2% error. That's great. Now, you notice in the first problem, uh, I had sort of a medium frequency of 64.5 hertz. 
This one is 1.86 hertz. Let's go for a higher frequency this time. All right, example problem number three. The capacitor um, is a 0.1 microfarad capacitor that really measured out to 0 0.095 microfarads. It's pretty close. And I'm using the same 21,700 ohm resistor. R times C uh, gives me 2.06 milliseconds. 2.06 milliseconds divided by 2.8 is 0 0.0736 milliseconds, or you could say 736 microseconds. That's my value of T. Let's calculate our frequency. I'm going to have to have 2 times T and take the reciprocal. Well, 2 times T is 1.4725 milliseconds. Take the reciprocal of that. That is 679 hertz. When I measured the output, I found 707 hertz with an error of 4% and a 47% duty cycle. This is what you have to know as you go up in frequency. You notice it was built on a breadboard, had some rather long wires, and there's a lot of interelectro there's some interelectrode capacitance and other issues to deal with. That will cause more errors the higher you go. As I understand, the 7414 will operate up to 5 or 10 megahertz, if that's what you really need. But as, again, as your frequency goes up, your stray capacitance in the breadboard or whatever comes, becomes more and more of a problem. All right, that completes this lesson in designing and building a simple square wave oscillator using the SN7414. I hope that you found this useful and fun to play with. Uh, you could use this thing for a CPU clock or maybe to generate interrupts on a uh, microcontroller. Or you could just use it as an adjustable signal generator if you want to switch out different capacitor and resistance values. I'm your host, Lewis Laughlin. Thanks for viewing my video and visit my website at www.bristolwatch.com.